Well, here we go again, but we can do this. Yes, here we are again for online worship. I know some of you are planning on joining us in our sanctuary or in our Family Life Center for gathered worship today. Uh, but as we've seen, these uh, the, the COVID numbers are very high, and, and for, for the next couple of weeks, we'll be gathering online. For some of you, nothing changes because you've been gathering online with us uh, since the beginning. So we know from this experience that God is going to transcend the space between us and draw us together in worship. So well. Welcome. And as we begin worship today, uh, let's hear from the Lord from our call to worship from Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Let's worship God together today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Worship with the People of God here at the First United Methodist Church here in Toms River, New Jersey. Because of some circumstances beyond our control, we are entirely virtual today. But remember, the Holy Spirit can still unite us together wherever we are. You know, missionaries from all around the world know this already, that wherever they happen to be at the edges of the earth, God has united us together by his spirit. So I hope that you feel the warmth and the welcome of God's people, the warmth and the welcome of the Holy Spirit, and that he brings you the hope and the peace and the joy that you and me and this whole world so desperately needs in these times. So welcome. Now, you know, no matter how many times you say something, whether you rerun something whether you let something go through your head many, many times, it doesn't always translate that well, does it? You know, there was a man who went to his doctor and he said, Doc, I'm afraid for my wife, I think she's going deaf. The doc said, really? That sounds serious. What's the problem? He said, well, when I say anything to her, I don't hear from her, I don't hear her say a word until about the fourth time that I say it. The doc said, yeah, that does sound serious. Well, this is what you do. Go home tonight, and when her back is turned to you, say something. If she doesn't respond, go about halfway closer to her, do it again. If not, halfway closer, do it again. And then the fourth time, if she doesn't say anything, just get up right behind her and say whatever you have to say and see if there's a response. And that way we'll see how deaf she is going. He said, okay, doc, sounds like a good idea. So he came home that night, he saw his wife in the kitchen preparing dinner, her back was to him, and he said, hi honey, what's for dinner? He didn't hear anything. So he moved halfway closer, and he said, hi honey, what's for dinner? Nothing, he didn't hear anything. So he moved half again closer, and he said, dear, what's for dinner? He didn't hear a word. He finally gets right up behind her, speaks directly into her ear, and says, Madge, what's for dinner? And his wife turns around, obviously irritated, and says, for the fourth time, meatloaf. <laughs> that was funny, don't you think? No, really, don't you think? <laughs> Wait, hold on a second. I guess it was funny, right? Anyway, the truth isn't always what we think it is. Chuck Swindoll tells the story of a farmer uh, who was what he called a, a functional pessimist. That is, he always seemed to be negative about life, even though he had been blessed. He'd buy this great equipment to harvest his fields, and all he could say was, boy, it sure is expensive. The, they would, the equipment would be able to... to harvest so much grain, and all he could say was, ah, sure is heavy to carry. And then the weather, he would be blessed all summer long with the best weather they ever had. And he would always say, ah, well, one storm could ruin the whole crop. And then he'd have a record-breaking crop at the end of the season, and all he could say was, sure takes a lot out of the soil. 
Swindoll believes that because of our sin nature, we have a tendency to rerun the more negative aspects of life through our heads. Things are usually seen as half empty to us, and we tend to rerun those tendencies over and over in our heads and our hearts. And it's happened to all of us, right? If, if you do or say or accomplish something and you are paid 99 compliments, but you get one critical comment, what do you focus on? Yeah, you focus on the negative thing, right? That's our human nature marred by sin, focusing on the negative. Now, part of growing in our faith is climbing out of a functional pessimism into a spiritual optimism, which over time allows us to give great thanks to God for all things, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the state of discourse in our country, and even regardless of, of Uncle Joe's bad behavior at Thanksgiving. We can still look at life with a positive, God-honoring vision. So let's take a look today at our passage. It's in Philippians 4, beginning in chapter, uh, Philippians 4, beginning in verse 4, for a different way to think and live. So let's take a look at our passage today. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put that into practice too. And the God of peace will be with you. So as we consider this passage, how can we move from a functional pessimism to a Christian optimism? Well, Paul tells us there in verse 4, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. How can we move from one to another? Well, when we rejoice, we really don't have time for pessimism, no matter how talented we may be at pessimism. I mean, a man said to his pastor one day, Reverend, I hate to keep complaining, but the Bible says we're supposed to do what we're good at. <laughs> that was a funny one too, don't you think? No, really. <laughs> yep, that was funny too. Anyway, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. He will say it again, rejoice. That's a good repeat, a, a good rerun to keep running through our head and our heart every day. For if we don't rejoice in the wonderful things of God, we're going to rejoice in the things of this world and develop an unhealthy attachment to them. And I'm wondering today, if you don't find yourself rejoicing more than your pessimism pessimizing word for the day, is it possible that you have an unhealthy attachment to the things of the world? Just wondering. My friends, the things of God in heaven are far more wondrous than anything we can conjure up on earth when we worry about the negative. Rejoice in the Lord always, he writes. I will say it again, rejoice. What's another one? Well, we have to see that God offers peace. We humans have a tendency to seek happiness instead of joy, right? One is short-term. The other one is long-term, life-term. We have a huge tendency only to seek a break in the action or to seek a flimsy ceasefire instead of looking for the real thing. Yet God wants every one of us to experience true and lasting peace, one that goes beyond any human understanding. Every human being is created to receive peace. As you are listening today as a human being, you were created to receive peace, which assures that God is ultimately in control and he will deliver us in his time. But, and this is important, really important, we need to be prepared with that truth before we need that truth. Because if we're not prepared, it will not be there when we need it. John Ortberg's pastor out in California, author, prolific author. Listen to what he has to say about it. You never really know what curves life will throw at you, what's lurking around the corner. But when you're in the middle of something difficult, and you will be in the middle of something difficult on some days, you need to know what to do. You need to be prepared. If you wait until a crisis hits, because it will hit, 
you've waited too long. You need to be prepared first. Folks, if it starts raining, it doesn't help to remember that you left your umbrella on the kitchen table, right? We need to be ready before the event happens. My friends, God can do it. And what is it? Anything that we need much better than we can. We'll never do it perfectly. God isn't asking us for perfection. I mean, that's why Jesus came and did the whole dying on the cross and rising from the dead thing, remember? But we need to decide to prepare. We need to decide to prepare. Did you hear that? We need to decide to prepare to have a life lived in the peace which comes from God caring for us. Preparation is the key. Now, what do we do to prepare for a peace-filled Christian life? Another great question. Let me try and answer it. We need to swim in all those godly things. That is, surround ourselves with all the goodness of God and all that he has done for us and all the caring that he is doing for us. Look at those last two verses again. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Friends, when we center our lives and minds on those things, we receive great encouragement, and we're able to give great encouragement. Listen for a moment. Truth, nobility, justice, purity, commendability, excellence, things worthy of praise. I get, I get chills when I hear those words, and it not, it's not just because it's 50 degrees here in the sanctuary. I mean, I really get chills. Those are powerful words. And if we center on those things, that's going to transform our relationships, our view of ourselves, our hopes for the future, and our view of Monday through Saturday living. It really will. If we center on those things, is there really any room for negativity or pessimism at all? No, not really. Larry Crabb is a Christian counselor who's done significant work over the years in the area of Christian counseling. And he writes that the only way that you and I can actually encourage people with our words is when the words we use meet two conditions. And those conditions are loving the person and easing the person's fear. And I find it interesting that that is exactly what Jesus did throughout the Gospels. Let not your hearts be troubled. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Have it to the full. All those are words that come out of the love that God has for us and his desire to allay our fears that the world is out to get us. Because the world is not out to get us, friends. It isn't and it won't because God is in control. Too often our attempt at encouragement is ought and must and should, right? We tend to address people's fears with our interpretation of the right way to solve a problem. What are some things that we've said over time? You know what you should do? You know, if I were you, I'd do this. No, 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 don't do that. That's dumb. Do it this way. Or, how's that working for you, right? Yet, what does God say? Be still and know that I am God. Encouragement, folks, is caring presence first and advice giving last. It's a little different than 2020's version of, of, of Judge Judy, Dr. Phil, and the keto diet, right? Ought and must and should. Now, just like Jesus, we encourage when we are there for the person first. If we're there for the person, God really does guide us to the next step. And it's different for each person. There's not some magic formula, not some cookie cutter that cuts into everybody's lives the same way. If that were true, we'd all look like gingerbread men or mini coopers or saltwater taffy. 
but we're not the same. And we must encourage people to seek out God so that God inspires them as the unique creations from his hand that they are. So that's how we fill each other with courage, right? That's what encouragement is, putting courage in somebody. Encouragement. For sure, we all have fears. We all have fears. I have fears. Pastor West behind the camera has fears. You watching today, we all have fears. But we can still be filling each other with courage. You know how it can sound. You can do it. God's given you the talent, and you are ready. God wants to bless you. God's bigger than this trouble. He'll carry you through. God made you for big things, brother or sister. You know what's right. And of course, my all-time favorite, I love you no matter what. Our words mean the most when they come out of love and a desire to calm fears under God's care. And what results? When our words are encouraging, we move from functional pessimism to Christian optimism. Those are the things we can keep running through our heads and hearts and keep overflowing into the lives of others because without encouragement of a community, we're not going anywhere. Isn't that right? Friends, we need to defeat negativity together. I'll encourage you with the things of God Paul speaks of in Philippians. You encourage me with the things of God that Paul speaks of in Philippians. And we'll encourage each other with the things of God that Paul speaks of in Philippians. And there will be no room for pessimism, only a bright future for God's people. And wouldn't it be great, I mean, wouldn't it be great if the 90,000 plus people who make up the Toms River community were to say one day, my goodness, every time I encounter one of those Christians who meets every Sunday at Chestnut Street and Old Freehold Road, whether I see them at the Blue Claws game, the ShopRite, the dry cleaner or the gym or the school function, I always feel accepted and encouraged and happy to be alive. In fact, I can even sense it through the masks they have to wear because of COVID-19. Wouldn't that be great? Imagine it, because I believe it can happen. All those things that Paul writes about in Philippians, think on all those things, for that is where the truth lies. Now, before we pray, I just want to encourage you to watch this video all the way through the end after the worship time. Let's pray. Mighty God, we are grateful. We are grateful for the chance to be together, even if it's virtually, because your Holy Spirit has drawn us close together as a family. Encourage us and strengthen us. Remind us, Lord, that we don't have to be in the state that we're in. We can actually move from functional pessimism, getting through the day, to Christian optimism, knowing that you have our best hopes and our, our best dreams lined up. Remind us, Lord, that you can make a difference in us right now so that that overflows into the lives of other people as we encourage them. Thank you, Lord for taking us from where we were to where you've called us to be, both now and in the future. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let's worship God together.
Hello everyone. Just a reminder, you have received or will receive in the mail our pledge card for 2021. Uh, this is a very important tool that we use. It allows our financial leaders to be good stewards with God's money throughout the entire year. And when we know what God's people are planning to give, we can make better decisions. It's pretty easy to fill out. You see a place for your name, for your address, your envelope number, and your phone number. And then you can make a pledge to either or both the Ministry and Mission Fund and the Building Fund. Ministry and Mission helps us to fund ministry throughout the year. The Building Fund is pretty self-explanatory. And if you could make sure to put the yearly total at the end of those lines, that would be very helpful. Also, if you need to have... If you need offering envelopes and don't have them, you can check that box and get them as well. This is vitally important, especially going into 2021. You know because of the pandemic, we've run into some uh, rough financial times. But your faithfulness so far has allowed us to do all the ministry that we're doing this year. And it is more vital than ever before for you to make a pledge for 2021. So if you've never made a pledge before, I really encourage you to do that for 2021. If you regularly make pledges, I want to encourage you to grow a step. 1% or 2% more than you've given in 2020. Because that will allow us to continue to do the ministry that the Toms River community and the world needs so desperately. Thank you very much and God bless you.